adventure, that burning desire to explore the unknown. Go where no human has gone before. Be the first to reach the peak or cross the continent. It's that desire that fueled the overland expeditions that made Land Rover famous around the world and produced the family of Land Rover vehicles we know today. The Land Rover has become a passport to adventure for millions of off-road enthusiasts. People looking for a 4x4 capable of taking them into unexplored territories. It's become popular with those who want a little luxury and the ability to go anywhere. Being able to venture off the posted highways and forge your own way through the world can be an exhilarating experience. Modern SUVs have reignited the explorer's spirit, but few have the history of Land Rover. In 1948, the Land Rover began life with a simple purpose, to give Britain a vehicle that could compete with Jeep. The Jeep had proven itself in World War II. A new model for the civilian market was about to be introduced. But across the Atlantic, in post-war Britain, plans were being made to unleash another consumer 4x4. The Wilkes brothers, who ran the Rover car company, were working on an idea prompted by Morris Wilkes' fascination with his surplus Jeep. Morris loved his Jeep, and the stout vehicle proved to be very handy around the farm. But he knew that it would eventually break down and parts would be impossible to find in England. The prospect of having to live without his Jeep gave Wilkes an idea. Why not build his own? The war had devastated the Rover car company. Raw materials were rationed. But if Wilkes could prove that he could export his new vehicle and bring hard currency into the country, he'd get what he needed. Tom Barton was one of the leaders responsible for the design and building of the original Land Rover. It was conceived, designed, and built within a year. The Wilkes were still using their Jeep, but not for long. They had something new. They had to substitute aluminum for steel on the new vehicle because they weren't able to get enough steel. The Land Rover was a huge hit at the 1948 Amsterdam Motor Show. But the brothers still had to convince farmers that the Rover could replace the horse. What I want, says many a farmer, is something that can do everything the horse can do, plus a lot more, and at three times the speed. And here it is, the Land Rover. A tough, chunky, cheeky, versatile vehicle with an unlimited capacity for hard work. They were right. There was more demand for the little Land Rover than they could fill. The plucky vehicle sported an 80-inch wheelbase, topped off with a 52-horsepower, four-cylinder engine and four-wheel drive. It became the farmer's best friend and the vehicle of choice for military forces around the world. promotional film made by the company more than 50 years ago 
describes the Land Rover. There's something about the purposeful, functional Land Rover that makes an irresistible appeal to the young and the young in heart. How's she different from an ordinary car? Ah, jump in and I'll show you. As the Land Rover grew in popularity, another dimension broadened its demand, the off-road possibilities of four-wheel drive. The Land Rover's capabilities appealed to a new class of automotive enthusiasts. Veering away from its farmland and workhorse image, owners began using the vehicle for exploration and recreational pursuits all over the world. It's claimed that the first vehicle ever seen by one-third of the world's population was the Land Rover. One of the most famous of many cross-continent adventures was the Oxford and Cambridge Expedition, an 18,000-mile overland journey from London to Singapore. Driving the first motorized vehicles ever to use this overland route, the expeditionary drivers were greeted by curious crowds, international press coverage, and champagne toasts on their arrival. But not everyone was happy with the original design. Barbara Wilkes complained to her husband, Morris, that the vehicle was not female-friendly. She wanted more comfort and fewer sharp edges, which, she said, ruined any number of stockings. In April 1958, Land Rover brought out an entirely new model, the Series 2. It featured a long list of modifications, a larger rear window to improve visibility, rounded quarter lights and fenders. Windows were made of non-scratch glass, and the doors had external handles with locks. The changes made the Series 2 easier to drive without sacrificing durability. Orders flooded in from many countries. They were exploring the jungles of Africa, serving on the front line, and doing jobs few other vehicles could tackle. Customers from around the globe ordered armored cars, ambulances, and even a lightweight version suitable for parachuting in. And of course, everywhere the army goes, the Land Rover goes too. Here she goes, weighing well over a ton with trailer. And here she comes, safe and sound. However, in America, the Land Rover was still something of a curiosity. A few have been imported over the years, but they were a rare sight. And while vehicles such as the Scout and the Bronco were being successfully introduced, on the trails of America, the Jeep was still king. Off-roading became the favorite pastime for families eager to escape the suburbs. but very few of them were doing it in a Land Rover. There were too many other choices, and less expensive too. Another problem, the strict emission regulations in America that would have required special models to be built for import into the States. Rover couldn't afford the investment, and they abandoned the US market. But in England, the Land Rover was the vehicle of choice for off-roading. Seeing how people were actually using 4x4s prompted the company to develop a more civilized vehicle. One that could be at home in the city as well as in the country. Sven King, a young engineer, was chosen to head up the project after successfully developing an innovative gas turbine car.
With vehicles like the Ford Bronco and the Chevy Blazer seen as their main rivals, Spen decided to take 10 to 15 Land Rovers on a competitive two-day safari alongside the competition. His design team evaluated the off-road capabilities of Land Rover, and in some cases, the lack of off-road ability of some of the other vehicles. The design team then built several prototypes before finally settling on the one to be called the Range Rover. Coming to market in 1970, it sported a new V8 engine that was powerful and lightweight. Permanent four-wheel drive gave it predictable traction. With its introduction, the new Range Rover, like the Land Rover 22 years before, became the automotive rage in Europe. The Range Rover was unlike any other 4x4. Its innovative design won numerous awards. It was even displayed at the Louvre in Paris as automotive art. To prove that these more refined vehicles could mix it with their stablemates, they were tested on some of the world's toughest country and trails. They crossed the Sahara, battled Panama's Darien Gap, traversed rough terrain from Alaska to the tip of Africa, all to prove that Range Rovers could go anywhere. One of the most famous expeditions was the Camel Trophy. This arduous, gut-wrenching event was called the Olympics of off-roading. Each year, amateur teams set out to conquer the most challenging terrain in exotic locations. Almost impenetrable jungle, hills and rocky riverbeds, the utter exhaustion of crossing remote locations tested the skill and endurance of every individual and the machines. In 1982, eight two-man teams from four nations crossed New Guinea. When the roads turned from track to muck to roaring rivers, the teams welcomed the bemused but skillful assistance of the local people. Land Rover was quick to exploit the adventurous mystique of their rugged vehicles with a series of outrageous television commercials. Land Rover had conquered markets worldwide, except one, North America. Executives wanted to return to this lucrative watering hole, but research said an expensive sport utility vehicle was not likely to sell. Americans wouldn't pay for luxury when they wanted utility. Land Rover decided the research was wrong, and work began on a super luxurious version of the Range Rover. In 1987, the company offered American buyers an exclusive Range Rover, loaded with options never before seen on a 4x4. Power seats, locks and windows, a sunroof, leather, wood trim, and a premium stereo system. The gamble paid off. It sold out. The company re-entered the U.S. market just as the SUV boom was about to take off. Range Rover stood out as the only upscale model in the pack. An expedition was mounted to prove that it was more than an oversized family sedan. In 1989, a convoy of eight Range Rovers 
made the first thousand mile crossing of North America's continental divide by motor vehicle. As the Range Rover was being rolled out around the world, engineers pushed on with high-tech innovations. They pioneered many four-wheel drive technologies to enhance safety and control. Tough machinery to keep the car going where you wanted it to go. By the end of the decade, Rover needed a new vehicle to compete with sophisticated and reliable Japanese models like the Toyota Land Cruiser. They wanted a 4x4 that had the creature comforts of a Range Rover with the ruggedness of the original Land Rover. The result was Discovery, launched at the Frankfurt Motor Show in 1989. Available only in a sporty three-door model, the Discovery was marketed to a younger, less conservative driver. When it arrived in North America, Four Wheeler magazine named it the 1995 Four Wheeler of the Year. But following unfortunate British automaking tradition, it had its teething problems. Like the Land Rover models before it, Discovery joined the expeditionary ranks. The Camel Trophy was by now so popular that a million people applied for this tough off-road journey every year. Discovery drivers signed on to the crossing of Siberia. They wanted to prove that it was a genuine Land Rover, worthy of the legacy that began with the original Land Rover, now dubbed Defender. In the 1990s came an explosion in the sport utility market. New ones arrived from Lexus, Hummer, and even Cadillac. But Range Rover, the first luxury SUV, was still the vehicle of choice for the country set. The company capitalized on its image and began to promote Land Rover as part of a lifestyle. And it was only a matter of time before owners of these go-anywhere vehicles decided to put them to the test. Land Rover driving academies are known as the world's most exclusive off-road driving schools, providing an intensive course on rough terrain. The program equips owners with the tools to explore some of the most beautiful places on Earth. But first, they must submit their skills and their vehicles to punishing tests. In 1994, the Range Rover celebrated its 25th birthday with a new model. Built in a new assembly plant, it was the most technically advanced vehicle they'd ever produced. The new Range Rover had to compete with a growing number of new sport utes from around the world. It wasn't enough to have heritage on your side. To distinguish itself from the rest of the pack, Land Rover concentrated on improving the buying experience. They did away with the traditional showrooms and put the sales force in casual clothes. Land Rover centers were created. They looked more like hunting lodges than car lots.
They even gave buyers the opportunity to put their new SUV to a real test. As sport utility vehicles became the hottest automotive market segment, Land Rover needed money for new products. At the same time, BMW was seeking to expand its own line of cars. They looked at the array of brands owned by Land Rover's parent company, Rover, Triumph, Mini, MG and Land Rover, and in 1994, they purchased the lot. In 1996, Land Rover turned 50. With new capital from BMW, it celebrated this anniversary by introducing a next generation of 4x4 vehicles, a mini SUV called Freelander. It was the first Land Rover without a separate chassis frame and the first with a transversely mounted engine. Originally developed for Europe, with more than 16 patented features, including hill descent control, Freelander was eventually marketed worldwide. It was not designed to replace or compete with the Range Rover, Discovery or Defender, instead being geared to a younger, sportier buyer. While new products were being developed and launched, BMW was suffering tremendous daily losses due to its purchase of the Rover Group. Shareholders were growing restive. BMW now had its own SUV with help from Rover, the X5, pressure mounted. BMW estimated that the disastrous Rover Group purchase had cost it $5 billion and it cut its losses. A year after the X5 debuted, it sold Land Rover to Ford. Land Rover was feeling stiff competition from Mercedes and others. Ford quickly announced its intention to fully support the Land Rover mark, as it had done with Jaguar and the people who drive these vehicles. Get to the top of the hill, first gear, no brakes, let hill descent control walk you down. Now this is my very first time doing this. This is an amazing car. Ah. Oh, God. I love you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This kind of loyalty has helped Land Rover stay alive in a crowded market. Owners are sometimes rewarded at special events, like this introduction of the Discovery 2 at a lodge in Colorado. Here, many owners are able to put the off-roading capabilities of these vehicles to the test, often for the first time. Driving through these rocky passages opens up a new world. It's easy to understand the appeal of these vehicles. Today, Land Rover is recognized around the world as a pioneer in the 4x4 market. It has managed to combine an image of luxury and utility, refinement with ruggedness. It's traveled from a basic utilitarian product in 1948 to become a true automotive icon. It's been estimated that three quarters of all Land Rovers ever built are still in use today. Land Rover's energy and innovative thinking hasn't changed much in half a century, but the technology has. This is where the future of Land Rover lies, as well as in the heart and soul of every great explorer who never let the absence of a road interrupt the quest for new adventure.